Good morning and welcome back to the IPGKBA's Virtual Colloquium 2020 organized by the Department of Planning, Innovation and Research. I am Annalisa Zaman from the Institute of Teacher Education in International Languages Campus, Malaysia. And I am the moderator for today's presentation. We would appreciate if the audience can register at the link given. Thank you. Now, before we proceed with today's presentation, I will briefly present to you the format. The speaker will present his talk for about 40 minutes. This will be followed by a Q&A session from the audience. If you have a question for our speaker, please feel free to post it in the chat box. The speaker questions at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, we will follow up afterwards. Now, allow me to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Balasandran Ramiya. His presentation for today is entitled 21st Century Instructional Leadership, Eight Touch Points. Dr. Balasandran has several accolades and among them are the excellent lecturer, special grade C in the field of strategic management and a master trainer and master coach and is currently attached to the National Institute of Educational Management and Leadership, Ministry of Education, Malaysia. He is also the Master Trainer of School Transformation Program 2025 and Professional Learning Community, Ministry of Education, Malaysia. He obtained a doctorate in Business Administration from University Science of Malaysia. He has vast experience in, tra in training, coaching, consulting, research and publication in the field of educational management and leadership at both local and international levels. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Balasandran Ramia. Thank you, Dr. Annalisa. A very good morning to everyone. Um, today, I'll be sharing about this 21st century educational leadership, a more of our Malaysian uh, experience in dealing with the uh, issues of instructional leadership at school level, uh, either in primary or even in secondary. So as you could see in the uh, screen, All right. Okay. Sorry about the short delay. <laughs> so um, my current topic today is on the 21st century instructional leadership, eight touch points. It's a Malaysian experience. Um, the focus of my presentation will be the mandate that we have in the Ministry of Education. Uh, what are the deliverables? The uh, MOE's initiatives, I mean, Malaysian uh, Ministry of Education initiatives, um, the instructional transformation that's taking place at the school level and some of the challenges that we are facing and some concluding remarks. Then we'll follow up with some questions and answers. So when you talk about really the mandate of uh, uh, the mandate, uh, the mandate we are talking about the Malaysian Educational Blueprint or we call it MEB. So in the Malaysian Educational Blueprint, uh, there are six attributes that needed by student to be globally com competitive. Uh, as we could see there, they need to have the right knowledge, the thinking skills, the leadership skills, they have the bilingual proficiency, uh, ethics and responsibility and national identity. Uh, there are 11 shifts uh, have also been identified as a, as a necessary step in transforming the existing uh, 
system, uh, like the current uh, organization that I'm attached to, Institute Amnudin Baiki, uh, we were given the task of Shift 5, that, that placing high performing school leadership uh, at the school level. Uh, so in Malaysia, most all the principals need to go through the national education, national qualification for executive leader program before they've been posted to the schools. So there are currently we are going through the three waves and we are now in the end of the second wave. Uh, so the first wave was to turn around the system by supporting the teachers and focusing on core skills. And now we are in the second uh, wave and we are in the tail of the second wave and we are moving to the third wave where we will move towards excellence with increased operational flexibility. Um, so as we could see, uh, it's a big document. It's a very thick document. But the, the thesis of the document of the core of MEB is about uh, each student. They need each student uh, have the student's outcome. Uh, we are focusing on students' outcome. It means we wanted a student who are holistically developed in terms of cognitive, psychomotor, and affective. And the second part of the, the core of MEB is each school need to be a quality school. So this quality school is determined by three main factors. That is the teacher's quality, the leadership effectiveness, and the commitment, support, and commitment. So our current uh, general director of education, uh, Dr. Habiba Binti Abdul Rahim, have outlined for 2020 a uh, uh, direction of focus of creating ownership and shared responsibility. A main target group here will be the students, the teachers and the educational leaders. When we talk about the educational leaders, we are talking about the system leaders who are in the department, who are in this in the uh, um, department, in the division. We are talking about school leaders. Uh, we are talking about middle leaders in the school. We are talking about various leaders who are who are involved in transforming the education. And we are focusing the accountability into four main areas such as students' involvement, uh, students' learning, um, teachers' and school leadership quality, leaders' quality, and, on, and also on the area of assessment. Uh, Malaysia has uh, own policy of school-based assessment. So there are some strategic programs that have been in place that to, to enhance and to, to support the accountability. Mainly, uh, we call it DTP, the District Transformation Program, where the district provide the, the relevant support to the school. As we talk about the district transformation program, uh, we have school improvement partners, and we also have school instructional specialist coaches to assist teachers and leaders in the process of transformation. We also have a special strategic program. We call this uh, trend, uh, the school transformation program 2025. And currently, we have our digital education. Malaysia have the digital education strategy for from 2020 to 2025. And finally, we also have the strategic program of enhancing teachers' assessment skills. There are other various uh, strategic programs also in place, such uh, especially STEM and also TVET and, and so forth. So when we talk about the deliverables, uh, we are talking about creating an atmosphere or an ecosystem for meaningful learning. So when we talk about meaningful learning, uh, 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 meaningful learning means we are talking about meaningful teaching and learning environment in the school. And what determines a meaningful uh, teaching and learning environment? Uh, when we talk about meaningful learning, we are talking about students' involvement, students' understanding, engaging, in the in in the process of learning, uh, there are various uh, approaches uh, in uh, in order to have meaningful learning. We talk about intentional uh, strategy, talking about active learning. We talk about deep learning. Uh, we talk about cooperative learning, and to in in order to have this meaningful learning, uh, we have some initiatives from the Ministry of Education. Uh, one of the most important initiative from the Ministry of Education is a school based assessment. As we see the school-based assessment, we are talking about five main, um, it's a holistic assessment. Uh, as we can see, uh, the alignment of students' outcome is based on the document, means the national curriculum. Uh, we're talking about the activities 
that students will go through. Uh, we have many activities, many strategies at the school level, in the classroom level, and it needs to be assessed in the classroom and centralized also assessment. So as we could see in the slide, there are four main school-based assessment. We are talking about the centralized assessment, which we have in the year six, grade six, we have in grade nine, and we have also on O level and A level. And in, when we talk about classroom assessment, we talk about uh, ongoing assessment. Uh, this is based on uh, the standard performance from level one to level six. And this will be done continuously by teachers, and they do have a kind, a kind of professional um, um, justification to decide an overall student's performance throughout the year. And we do talk about core curriculum. We talk about core curriculum assessment, uh, where we measure in terms of their attendance, their involvement, their achievement, and their leadership skills. We talk about more on health. We call the program SEGA where we're looking at students' BMI and their health, and they may have the right emotional mind in order to pursue their learning process. And finally, the psychometrics. Uh, we have some psychometric assessment in the school where this measurement is used uh, to identify uh, the uh, students' inclination towards the area of interest. Some of them will be linguistic, some of them are naturalists, and so forth. And this has practically uh, been, um, been administered by the school counselors. Uh, when we took at the holistic school assessment, uh, they, or we call it the National Education Assessment System. Uh, in, in, in Malay, we call it SPPK. Uh, we could able to see a child, uh, a student's profile. Uh, the student's profile, I'm just giving an example of a year of grade six. We call it year six, uh, but actually in the international level, it's in a grade six as a child who are K-12, a student's profile. And we see uh, this is a, a kind of a, a web graph to see how we assess, how we, we um, disseminate information about the, uh, the student's profile. We look into the centralized assessment. Uh, like we're talking here, we call it UPSR. Uh, the centralized exam is in a year six exam. The same profile will even appear at the grade nine and even in grade 11 or A level and, and also, uh, sorry, O level and also A level. So when you talk about a centralized assessment, they are around um, seven, uh, six subjects, uh, seven subjects, uh, uh, sorry, six subjects that they have to, they have to undergo. And we only measure them from uh, the minimum uh, achievement requirement, which is, a, which is a D. And then we talk about a school-based assessment. When we talk about school-based assessment, there are a general interpretation of level of mastery in classroom-based assessment. It is based on some levels and some standards. And the minimum standard is required is level three, where the students should able to know, to understand and able to do. As we could see, you see in Bloom Taxonomy, it's the level three uh, from application onwards. And we have the core curriculum activities, uh, which is measured from other five elements that I mentioned just now, the attendance, the achievement, uh, the involvement, and also leadership skill. And they've given it a grade. And we talk about the health. Uh, we talk about the BMI, physical fitness, uh, uh, physical fitness, and also body body mass uh, index. Uh, we do talk about um, uh, the psychometric or the interest of the student. Uh, we we use a multiple intangible uh, inventory. Uh, these are some of the just the data of of a child we took, and this could able to see the student's outcome. Uh, this is how the teachers uh, disseminate information where we wanted to see a child is uh, progress holistically, not, not only on the area of cognitive uh, or just uh, psychomotor. So in order to achieve this uh, dream to produce a, a quality school or to produce the meaningful learning for the students outcome and the supporting factors of quality school in terms of teachers, in terms of leadership and also uh, in terms of the community support, uh, we need to have this instructional transformation. Uh, I, I have adapted this uh, concept of 21st century instructional leadership, some touch points, and I'm just looking it into the Malaysian experience and how we go about dealing with these uh, eight touch points. So these are the eight focus, or I could call it the eight touch points. Uh, we talk about supervision. We talk about the way we implement the curriculum. We talk about the assessment, the instructions, 
the technology, the culture and climate in the school, the professional development, and how the instructional transformation plan uh, takes place in the school. So let's look into the uh, supervision. So when we talk about supervision, it's not about seeing whether teachers have met certain standards, but it's more about uh, providing effective feedback. So we are looking at the supervision more into a developmental approach. As we could see the word supervision, there's a vision and there's an element of super. So when we talk about supervision, it's not only checking the performance of the teacher, whether the teacher meets a particular standard. If we have a national quality standard, we call it standard four, there are six standards that teachers need to meet. So it's not all about meeting the standards, but how we could able to uh, coach and also provide the right support to the teachers by providing effective feedback. Even Mazano have uh, said that providing effective feedback for students uh, do enhance the performance of students. And here we are talking also about providing effective feedback. So in the school now, we are more focusing into a more of a developmental kind of a supervision where we are moving towards instructional coaching. Uh, we're talking about the impact cycle, the impact cycle and so forth. And um, uh, this is the standard. I'm sorry, it's a bit small, but you could able to see, I tried to put the whole standard into a, a, a kind of a Lotus, Lotus Blossom uh, framework. You could see the colors in the middle. Uh, they are the standards. Actually, there's six standards, but there's two standards have sub-standards. We're talking about teachers as a planner, uh, we, we can see some of the schools, we might have teachers who are lack in the planning. So there is one standard on the area of planning and there are some items on the area of planning. Uh, we talk about uh, lack of uh, control uh, in the class and then we have some items there and there are all these items around. And one of the most important item, the one in the green, the part of developing, encouraging the mind development. Uh, there are the seven uh, elements there and the, the one in the orange and color where we wanted active students learning. So as you could see, the uh, development, the mind development and uh, student as an active learner, there are seven items in both area, uh, seven items in the both area. And um, we could see that um, uh, the items are actually mirrored. For example, I could able to show you that seven items in a more clearer picture. Um, uh, uh, we look into like the first item, how the teacher stimulates students to communicate. Uh, this is an item in 4.41. I'm talking about uh, developing the mind. And then we are looking at the same side here, how we could able to see whether student is an active learner. So when we talk about communication, we should able to look around 90 to 100 percent students communicate during learning activities. As it goes to the other standards, we look at whether the teacher stimulates students to work collaboratively. And the other side, we can able to see whether 90 to 80, 100 percent students uh, are doing learning activities collaboratively. We could see other elements and it's quite similarly mirrored to the other side. There was a question from the floor, um, um, sorry, from the audience. Is that how should the school leadership adjust to the post uh, pandemic effect on the school based assessment? Uh, for classroom-based assessment as there's still demand for people's grades. Uh, thank you, uh, Charles Ling, for the question. Uh, it's currently, we are looking at alternative uh, assessment. As the schools are reopened, um, we are currently uh, doing assessment as, as usual. In Malaysia, the situation is not as, as severe as, as other countries, but the school are due reopen and we're having most of the assessments are there, but we do have some issues that certain district the schools are closed for certain reasons due to the uh, uh, the second wave and uh, the third wave uh, but they are talking about this uh, alternative assessment uh, teachers are uh, uh, making efforts uh, how could they do uh, uh, measures uh, to to encourage uh, to to implement the alternative assessment all right as we can go further uh, look at some of the action plans. These are some, some my personal suggestions. Uh, what will be the action plans when it comes about supervision in terms of development? So I think what is the most important in Malaysian context, uh, we have the standards. In other countries, they might have their own standards in the classroom. I think there should be an, a reflective dialogue on the standards. A lot of teachers know the standards, but they do, do not uh, internalize the, the standards. 
uh, the second most important is they should have some kind of a self-assessment on the standards rather than another person assessing them. Or they could ask a peer-led review about how good is the lesson so that they don't feel it's very threatened when there's a teacher enter the classroom or somebody, uh, the leadership enter and supervise them. And the third element is uh, school need to organize focus continuous professional development based on the standards. Like for example, if you could see the teachers could not do collaborative uh, activities in the class and the students are not engaged in learning collaboratively, there should be some uh, CPD on collaborative cooperative learning uh, need to be conducted. There need to be data collected through a learning walk or through some kind of a uh, measurement and this data need to be used by the school management in order to, fo to have focused CPD uh, for the teachers. And finally, uh, we need to develop school-based instructional coaches. It's no point expecting coaches from the district to come and uh, help the school. We need to develop internal coaches. We need to develop the coaching skills among senior leaders, uh, teachers who are experienced teachers, who are able to coach. And there are many models to coach them. And they could able to coach novice teachers, new teachers. So uh, what is more important is school should be in a learning organization. School is in a learning organization that where school teachers could able to learn from their own colleagues. There should be a, an environment of a professional learning community in the school. So the second uh, focus point that I'm going to talk is about on the curriculum. So as we talk about the curriculum, we need to talk about unpacking the curriculum. This, this is the current. We are not looking at uh, delivering the curriculum as what is in the uh, in our syllabus. We look into a modular approach. Uh, this is the way forward that where our teachers are currently working. So I could able to see uh, how are the three stages on the backward design. They identify the desired results. They determine the acceptable evidence of learning and plan learning experience and instructions. So like an example, I just show you in, in a worksheet, uh, the teachers able to, to identify the standards or the learning outcome as a step one. Then they could copy and paste the same standard in the step two and just circle all the verbs. The verbs will represent the things that need to be developed. And then the same standard need to be copy and paste in step three, where they underline all the knowledge, the nouns there. And they look at what are the pre-educate knowledge that or students need to have in order to follow or they already had before they follow the lesson and finally only the teacher need to look into the instructional needed for the teachers i mean look at the third main focus is in the assessment so uh, we are all currently uh, working on uh, with a lot of teachers on this area we are looking into the assessment where we are looking more into the higher order thinking skills uh, this is our Malaysian, our curriculum development division. Uh, this is our working definition for higher order thinking. And we could see it starts uh, on, from the level of application. So we are looking at into the international uh, characteristic of good thoughts question, where uh, the question has the stimulus. It has a multiple layer of thoughts. Uh, they give questions which are unfamiliar context, uh, questions which are related to real life situation and questions which are non-repetitive. Uh, these are very necessary. Like an example, this is a team visa question. We could see this question where uh, which visa is better value for money? Show your reasoning. And we could see it also related to real life. It also involved different layer of, uh, of multiple of domain of thinking where it's talking about analysis, it's talking about reasoning. Um, and also, it also talking about real life. And these are some unfamiliar questions that teachers and students will be facing. So we are encouraging our teachers uh, to make horse questions uh, in their daily exercises, not only in the assessment. For this, the school leadership need to have a policy uh, to determine the percentage of, of uh, higher order questions need to be in the assessment, either in the formative or, or in the summative assessment. And this, this, is certain, this is one of the focus area on the area of uh, assessment. So, so what are the action plans that we need to look in the area of assessment? I think one of the most important is school need to have their own policy. The percentage of lots and odds questions in formative and summative, in, even in students' homework policy, students by having a homework policy. And we also need to incorporate lots and hots into the school homework policy, as I mentioned just now, and organize focus CPD. Uh, now teachers are... Uh, uh, 
do not have that privilege to develop a lot of questions and there are a lot of resources available for them to take questions from the net or, or even from the source. So we need to have a lot of uh, workshops for the teachers uh, for how they can tweak some questions from a lower order question to higher order questions and able for them to have a, a specification table to ensure that each assessment meets the school policy in terms of percentage of higher order questions. Uh, we need to carry out uh, teachers' professional dialogues uh, based on the topics. Sometimes teachers do uh, item analysis, but more on the topics. But they need to look into the learning area that the students are having issues. And that information, there must be a kind of dialogue among the teachers because we need to know that every assessment is not to prove, but is to improve. Uh, such culture needs to be changed in, in the schools. So, so the next uh, focus area is the area of our instructions. Uh, uh, we need to have this 21st century element in, 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 in instruction. We are talking about uh, uh, the research-based uh, uh, instructional strategies, uh, the research-based classroom uh, management strategies. Uh, we have John Hattie's work and, and many and uh, Mazano's work. And these are the things that teachers need to look so that their practice is not just based on their experience, but also they could able to uh, place their experience uh, uh, against some of the uh, research-based uh, findings, so that they could make they can able to make a, a more learn learn a kind of decision when they decide or implement a particular strategies. So when we talk about effective uh, strategies. Uh, we are not just talking about instructional strategies, we are talking about also the classroom management strategies and how the curriculum design. But in Malaysian case, the curriculum is very much centralized. But how we implement the curriculum, unpack the curriculum in the school, how we put the curriculum into a subject-based classroom mode, or how we have our timetabling, that can be decided by the principals the school uh, principals. When we talk about classroom management, what are the right strategies for teachers to use for classroom management and also the instructional strategies? So uh, I like to share uh, the casual uh, framework here, uh, the stick starting points on how we could able to uh, have a 21st century classroom. Uh, we talk about reflective questioning, we talk about developing thinking skills, we talk about using a lot of graphic and visual mapping, we talk about collaborative networking, and we talk about personal disposition and also structuring the environment. I may just show you quickly some of the strategies can be used in all the six starting points. Like for example, on reflective questioning, these are some of the uh, strategies can the teachers could use. Seven Kipling, Squee Matrix, Three Tier Intellect, Socrates questioning and so on. When you talk about thinking, we can use a Bloom taxonomy when we're doing uh, Core curriculum activities, we can do the psychomotor domain and effective mode domain. When you talk about using visual mapping, we talk about course, thinkers tools, six thinking maps, thinkers key, thinking maps. There are so many other visual mapping because research has proven that the more students are used with maps and graphics, they're able to connect. It's based on the way the brain is, when, is well connected with, uh, because they could able to understand more things which is, they could able to see visually. And we also need to look into various structures in cooperative learning. I think we have Kagan's uh, cooperative learning uh, strategies for uh, to be to be referred. And when we talk about personal disposition, we're talking about emotional and multiple intelligence. We're talking about habits of mind. There are 16 habits of mind, the work of Kelly and Paula. We could even look into that. When you talk about structuring the classroom, we're talking about cluster learning, station learning, generic classroom subject-based classroom, how we physically set up the classrooms, how we have learning corners, how we have station learning and, and so forth. So these are some of the strategies that teachers could look into uh, in the area of instructional. And in the area of technology, especially now with the post-pandemic effect, we could see a lot of, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a great need for teachers to, to use uh, digital uh, learning, need to use digital apps in, in the uh, delivery of their instruction. So when we talk about technology, it's not just about using Google Classroom or using Zoom and so on. They need to have uh, strategies how to engage students uh, while they're having online assessment, online uh, instruction. Uh, they need to look at uh, various digital apps that are available 
where we could get students get engaged in the lesson rather than they listening to the um, uh, to the to the instructor as how i'm doing now i'm still looking at the questions are uh, been posted to me so there should be some engagement uh, we could have padlets we can have uh, uh, quizy.com we can have kahoot we can have so many ways where digital uh, digital application that could be uh, could be in, uh, chosen uh, can be can be referred by the teacher there is another question uh, asking for a copy of presentation well i i will share that uh, is instructional leadership the sole responsibility no definitely it's no but this is the core of the of the school leadership is the core of a school leadership a school leadership is see when we talk about uh, leadership there's only one leadership element which refers to the school leadership uh, which is uh, there are other elements the school leadership need to be a transformational leader leader you need to be an ethical leader but instructional leader is is the core business of the school leader how could the effectiveness and efficiency of uh, this another question or same person of instructional leadership be meaningfully assessed to promote and ensure optimal students uh, learning outcome uh, this is definitely could be able to be assessed uh, the effectiveness when we talk about effectiveness and efficiency i rather like to look into word of uh, of uh, uh, effectiveness effectiveness is talking not about uh, meeting a particular standard but in order to see whether there's an a value added in malaysia we have our national uh, quality standard for school principals there are uh, five main standards uh, that the principals need to meet uh, they are been assessed by a uh, impartial body uh, our school inspectorate uh, it the same instrument also will be used by the district the school also could use some of the kpis that they have developed uh, for the based on the school based on some of the key result area so we need to measure in order to manage we need to measure so this measurement can be self measurement it can be also based on some some uh, national standards uh, and in order to see whether we are effective or not effective we need to see in terms of uh, how well we meet the uh, the kpis and if we don't meet the kpis what should be the steps need to be taken what are the remedial actions need to be taken in order to meet so i work to many schools at a school level and sometimes they have some issues uh, in terms of academic they even have issues in the core curriculum they have issue, even issues in the students retention or students attendance in the school uh, there are some uh, some dashboards in our ministry of education we in the district transformation program there are some uh, dashboards like in malaysia we have a dashboard on students enrollment we talk about dashboard into in terms of students attendance we, we have dashboards about students achievement we have dashboard uh, measuring parental involvement in the school there are many kpis are there so principal could use that to measure the effectiveness uh, especially the kpis related to instructional leadership so i could go into the technology we are not talking about using of technology we are talking about a wider usage of technology there are many digital uh, applications which is available so let's look into the culture and climate so what is the culture and climate that we need to create in the school so we need to know that in terms of bringing the classroom from the current status to a 21st century learning in line with the four pillars of unesco uh, we need to move or not only the physical setup of the classroom we we need to move to another level where we need to look into engaging the student focus student focus uh, instruction to we need to move into a third level where we need to create an uh, uh, environment ecosystem where uh, there is a culture of inquiry or problem based learning in the school in malaysia uh, we are under the transformation school program we are encouraging schools to do more of a problem based learning project based learning even our teacher training institution also is embarking on this so schools are now we are looking to more integrated problem based learning where it's not only a particular subject but we do integrate many subjects so most of this problem based learning in malaysia is is been led by uh, the stem department the stem unit where science maths and technology and also we have robotic can be a computer and these are the things that we need to develop because uh, in the 21st century what we need to develop for the ir 4.0 and and so forth is the skill of inquiry critical thinking creative thinking 
uh, where students could able to work in a collaborative uh, uh, atmosphere. Uh, so that is the culture. That is the one is the important touch point uh, in the uh, 21st century uh, instructional leadership. So we could see this is a simple uh, protocol of how we do the uh, uh, problem-based learning. Uh, um, finally, uh, we are looking at the seventh touch point. The seventh touch point is the professional development. We know that currently many schools do CPD on weekends, on Saturdays for two hours, inviting outside. But we know that such uh, initiatives do not uh, translate into uh, into classroom. And many of these ideas, the research has proven that most of the CPDs only have 10% of, of the things to learn in this uh, organized uh, CPD has been transferred to the classroom. So I think uh, my personal opinion is the, the future professional development need to move from the formal kind of activity into an informal kind of activity led by peer. So we are looking into professional learning community. Uh, I currently involved in professional learning community, more on the leadership part and uh, even the Ministry of Education and make it is one of the main strategic program. Uh, we're looking into how teachers could able to sit together and able to do a lesson study, uh, how we could encourage uh, coaching. There are various strategies, various uh, protocols that we could use uh, in order to develop a professional learning community. Uh, so where teachers could sit together, do an inquiry about a student's learning issue. And once they do the inquiry, they come up with the right innovation, a kind of a strategy, and then they go and implement in the class rooms the others observe each other when they finish doing that they come back and they they have a reflective dialogue on it they share their views and they come for they, they, they do conclude with a future improvement plan uh, so this is our Malaysian and in Malaysian case uh, we are having our own uh, professional learning model we call it the fees model where the teachers will sit, they will have a focus area, uh, they will find an area how to improve things, and then they come back and share. Uh, so there are a kit that we provide to all the teachers, which they could use this as a guide uh, for them to do PLC, but they also been encouraged to use various other protocols like lesson study, uh, peer coaching, uh, horizontal and vertical uh, meeting, a book club, and many other strategies. So in detail, there are actually so many collaborative tools. They can use many of the collaborative tools, but uh, currently there are around uh, 13 collaborative tools been, been exposed, even though we have more than 13 uh, to expose to the teachers. And they use this model in order for them to implement that, that uh, collaborative tools. I mean, they can use the collaborative tools. Like for an example, even they use a lesson study. Even in the lesson study, they might have they will have a focus area. What is the learning issue? What is the learning objective? Then they develop a lesson plan. In the lesson plan, there is an innovation in the lesson plan. Then they will go and implement the lesson plan in the classroom where other teachers observe, observe them. Then they see how the lesson plan works in the classroom. Then they come back and they have a reflective dialogue. So even you're using any of the uh, uh, protocols that I have, the collaborative uh, tools and protocols, it still, uh, based on this particular model. So this is what we've been doing um, for the uh, past uh, 10 or uh, years, uh, especially when the first wave, we started this from the first wave. By the second wave, we are quite clear on how we are doing this. Uh, we have we're having a model and teachers are more, uh, we even have a system in our Malaysia uh, to measure whether teachers are involved in PLC. We call this uh, um, training management system. So it's in MLA here. Uh, we have a website where teachers could go into the application or whenever they do the PLC, they could register the activities. And there is a dashboard. The principal could able to measure this. And the same dashboard can be measured by the division and also the ministry level. So this is how we are going to look into the, uh, whether teachers are engaged in professional learning community. So there are some action plans that I may suggest in order to uh, culturalize this uh, professional learning community. Uh, first, we need to measure every activity. Need to measure. We don't measure, we don't manage. We don't manage, we don't change. We don't change, we don't transform. 
So measuring is one of the important elements. So we are measuring it through our own system. We call it SPL KPM, our PLC. Uh, currently, there is a, a requirement for, by the ministry. Each teachers need to have 42 credit points in terms of uh, professional development. And 20 cre credit points comes from PLC. So teachers could, could we are encouraging teachers to do a PLC so that they could also get a credit point. At the same time, we can measure whether this is in a culture uh, in the school. How effective is PLC in Malaysian school? Any evidence to show? I'm actually, Balkis, thank you for the question, Balkis. We are measuring it through our SPL KPM. For your information, uh, we have more than 70% of the teachers in Malaysia are already engaged in, in, the, in the professional learning community because we're able to measure it uh, through the uh, SPL uh, KPM. However, however, uh, the, the, the level of involvement, it, it differs from school to school because for them to do one uh, cycle of learning, it will learning uh, of professional learning community, they only get five credits. So they are encouraged to do at least five, four cycle of professional learning community in a year. Uh, but they can even do more than that. But however, however, we see that it differs from school to school. But the teachers even have other uh, professional development activities. They can do action research. They can do uh, um, benchmarking in other schools. They can do e-learning. They can have CPDs. Uh, they can have they can have uh, reading activities. But the focus is we are encouraging teachers to do PLC. So uh, when we talk of PLC, we are having around 40 weeks of school weeks in Malaysia. Uh, we are not asking them to do every week. Uh, an hour uh, in one fortnight, uh, they can have 20 hours. Uh, it can be structured in the timetable. At end of the time, we can block the timetable. Many schools does that in Malaysia. Many district does that. And what they do is uh, for them to do one cycle, um, it might take like three or four meetings. So we could able to do like in 20 hours, they can actually have four cycles. It's, it's, it's an easy task to get 20 credit. Uh, and we are encouraging teachers to have uh, a focus area based on students learning issue, not simply what are the area that teachers feel they need to improve, but more on what is the need of the students. So they need to use the students data. They need to have some kind of pre-test. They need to use the school assessment uh, to see where is the learning area of a child. Uh, whether the child have an issue in a particular uh, learning issue like mathematics, are they, are they having uh, an issue, let's like, say they're having an issue on algebra, uh, how we actually overcome that issues? Who are the students? What are the issues? Why this issue happens? So this PLC group do it informally and it should become a culture of the school and it's happening in Malaysia. Uh, but uh, we need to accelerate the effort to make it uh, a culture in all the schools. Uh, there need to be organized, focused workshops on PLC or collaborative tools. So many teachers know what is a PLC, but they might not be aware how to do a lesson study, how to do an excellent research. So there need to be organized, a uh, focused PLC. And uh, we need a simple reporting. Even though we have a measurement through SPL KPM, uh, in order for, uh, uh, for us to, to, to measure the effectiveness, uh, they could able to post, uh, the school could able to have their own own simple reporting system. Nothing so difficult. They can even share it in uh, social media. Or uh, what is the focus area they choose? What is the uh, innovation they have implied, uh, they have applied in the classroom? What was the outcome of their intervention? Uh, what will be their future action? So once we put the teachers in the mode of reflective dialogue, uh, we could able to see a lot of changes. Yeah. So um, I'm going to the final part of uh, uh, my uh, presentation, okay? Uh, finally, we need to have uh, uh, instructional transformation plan. Uh, all these seven focuses need to be into a put a plan. And I suggest that we don't do everything at one shot. Uh, uh, the best suggestion will be focus on two or three agenda yearly. Uh, we could use a simple structure now, next, future. Uh, we can look in 2020, 21, and 22. Maybe the school need to look into supervision this year. And maybe next year, they look into, uh, they extend it to other departments. Uh, they can be able to implement uh, perhaps certain digital apps this year in technology, maybe more in next year. They can start 
of a PLC, but more on lesson study this year, and they can do some other next year. So we don't have all the eight areas at one go. The plan should look into two to three agenda. Uh, as it gives, should give a soft landing uh, for the teachers and the management so that transformation happens slow, happens continuously, but at the same time, not drastically at the school. So that change could be able to be implemented if, effectively. Uh, that is my general suggestion on the, uh, on the uh, transformation plan. So uh, how we can do it? We can do it simply in, a, in using a, um, a Lotus Blossom. Uh, we put the eight areas around like supervision, what are the things that they need to do? And then they can transform that into uh, the action. So finally, let's look at some of the challenges. When we're doing all this transformation program in Malaysia under the MBB, MEB and, uh, and so forth, we do have some issues of what we call implementation deep. Michael Fullen have mentioned there will be an implementation deep. So all successful school experiences, experience implementation deep as they move forward. Uh, it is a deep where there is a deep in, in performance, there is deep in confidence and also as one encounters on innovation. So sometimes when teachers are embarking on certain things, we can't expect things to change immediately. There can be a deep. Uh, that is where we need to reflect. Uh, we need to see what are the new skills needed. We need to have, uh, an, uh, have a bigger horizon about the understanding so that we can come out from the deep. If not, we'll be in the deep for a very long time. Yeah. So, uh, see, why am I saying this is important, especially now with the pandemic? Uh, we have actually a four scenarios of, uh, uh, of schools now. See, we have students from we have a home educative environment. So some of them have high home educative environment, means parents are concerned, parents are uh, helping them, parents are supporting them in the education. And we also have students uh, who have an academic self-concept, where students participate and engage. So when both are high, we have good scenario. But now with the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, we have many students who don't have their home educative environment, no gadgets, no support. Parents have lost their jobs. Parents do not have the right resources to help them. They don't even have the uh, internet access. At the same time, the child has a very low self-academic concept. So when they miss the school more than three or four months, uh, we're going to have, we have students of the scenario four coming back to the school and it's going to be very challenging for the school and they need to look into plans how they can handle students in the uh, in the fourth scenario and if we have students in the scenario one well it's a blessing but we might also have students in scenario three home educated environment is very high but the students is not engaged you can do a google classroom but they just must often mute it and they let the teacher speak to herself <laughs> and also we might have the scenario two where students have high a self-academic concept, but they don't have the home educative environment. So this is very necessary for the school to look where your students are and who are the students who are coming back to the school. What will be your strategies to deal with different uh, pocket of students here? So that is very critical for me. Yeah? So as a concluding remarks, we look at the eight focus area and each focus area have some elements that we need to focus. So when you talk about supervision, we talk about providing feedback. It's not about measuring whether the teacher just meet the standards, is how to provide effective feedback. When we talk about curriculum, we look in, into how we can unpack the curriculum. When you look at assessment, we look into thinking skill, higher order uh, assessment. When we talk about instruction, we look into strategies of 21st century uh, elements. When we talk about technology, we talk about a wider usage of technology. When we talk about culture, we talk about uh, developing inquiry-based, problem-based learning culture in the school. When we talk about professional development, move from the formal to the informal way, where we talk about a professional learning community, for, for a professional learning community. When we talk about instructional transformation program, don't talk about all the agendas. Focus around two or three agenda yearly. And you do uh, continuously, as what Japanese say, Kaizen, continuously, but focus on two or three area. Uh, with that, uh, uh, we need, in order to have uh, such changes, we need to have uh, school heads who are leading learning. Uh, we need school heads who are lead learning. Uh, we need to develop the middle leaders in the school. So the responsibility of transformation is not only the senior leadership team, but the middle leadership team and the teachers. And we need to understand different schools have different contexts. And now with the pandemic, the contexts are even varies from school to school. 
with that thank you very much uh, um, uh, we have uh, we wanted to open up for question and answers uh, i've answered some of the questions there are a few more questions here um, thank you for the questions anyway uh, if i could not able to answer the questions you able to communicate with me through the uh, through the uh, uh, email uh, uh, that I might share these uh, slides. Uh, you might be able to see the slides in the uh, website later. So what are the challenges that instruction leaders faced? I think this is based on uh, Tally's report. Uh, they could see that one of the major challenges by instructional leaders is they could not balance between their administrative role and also the uh, instructional role. We could able to see many principles uh, uh, very much uh, focus into their role of administrative role and uh, they might have led the instructional part to the to the uh, to the hands of their the middle management or their assistants so that is something that we need to uh, look into uh, how the principal able to play a role of moving from the administrative role uh, towards the um, uh, instructional uh, leader role and another biggest challenge is the principal could not do a lot of transformation, but they do in silo. They do in, in small pockets, but they need to have this school-wide approach. Whenever you're doing a transformation, even though it's, it's, it's a small step, baby step, but you need to have this uh, school-wide approach. Uh, uh, another major uh, obstacle, I think currently with the pandemic, we have a lot of uh, opt uh, uh, obstacle. In Malaysia, uh, we have a lot of rural and uh, schools which are in a very interior schools uh, where students are having uh, some issues with accessibility on internet and also other uh, educational resources so this could be some of the biggest challenges and we also have uh, uh, teachers uh, various teachers background training uh, some teachers need to be retrained uh, some teachers need to be uh, uh, reoriented uh, based on the context of the school uh, a, a teacher who works in a city of Kuala Lumpur will have a very different atmosphere than working in the interior part on Sabah and Sarawak. Uh, so we need to develop the uh, the soul of the teachers. Uh, how to develop a soul of a teachers where they are they are passionate about their work, they are reflective about their work. So this is one of the biggest challenge that I find from my experience that principals are actually facing with their kids because uh, is. The student's achievement is how well the teacher teach, as well the students learn. And who manage the teachers? The principals. So th there is an issue of effective monitoring, effective support for the teachers, effective coaching and mentoring. So these are the skills that need to be developed among the leaders. There's another, thank you for the question, Basilia. There's another question, uh, the, the big challenge in our country is the internet connection, uh, not free. Oh. Okay, hey, uh, well, uh, we are actually uh, making some efforts in Malaysia. Uh, we're having some uh, social cluster. We have some effort, New Deal. The ministry is, is trying to provide the right uh, gadgets for the students. Uh, also give them some kind of a gig for them to be able to use. But teachers need to understand, but they need to, to use variety of uh, way of, uh, of uh, reaching the students. Uh, during the pandemic, we even have teachers have prepared modules for the students and leave the modules at the guard house where the parents can come and pick up. And their teachers have, uh, have went to the villages and surrendered some of the worksheet for the students. So I think um, there's no one best method uh, for us to, to bring the change. And especially such challenging time, we, we are, there's one good part about challenges is it makes us to be very creative, uh, creative in dealing with the challenges. I think uh, all of us are in the same boat, uh, but creative, being creative is one of the best way to, to handle the situation. Any other questions? So thank you very much. I passed back to the moderator, uh, Dr. Analiza. Thank you. Yeah, back to you, Dr. Analiza. Right, thank you, Dr. Bandasandaran, for the insightful presentation. 
The eight focus points are certainly enlightening. Definitely, there's a lot to consider to ensure the initiatives are impl implemented successfully. Um, we have a few, we have about two questions here. If you don't mind answering, yeah. Right. Um, the question is, um, how important is the role of middle leadership team in an, in ensuring quality instruction delivery? Okay. So you want me to you want to give both questions or? I answer this one first. Eh? Um, which which which, uh, which would you prefer, one by one or two? Okay, I'll one go? Uh, the question is about the middle leadership team. Uh, actually, the yeah. current actually now when we talk about instructional leadership, we're not talking about the school leadership is the hero, the one that handles everything on instructional. Mm -hmm. Because now it, we are talking about shared instructional leadership. When we talk about shared instructional leadership, the responsibility and the role need to be shared by both team, by the school leadership, senior leadership team and middle leadership team. So the middle leadership team need certain skills because they're the one dealing directly with the teachers. They're the one communicating mm -hmm. with the teachers. They're the one supposed to translate the vision of the school, uh, the ideas of the school, the policy of the school, where they can translate to the teachers. So the middle leadership need to develop certain skills. Uh, one of the important skills they need to develop is the skill of giving effective feedback to the teachers, the skill of uh, uh, coaching the teachers, uh, the, uh, the skill of able to use a big data, uh, able to use various data available in the school, uh, able to guide the teachers how to use that data, uh, and able to give the, the, uh, the right um, resources uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the teachers, uh, for them to able to bring the changes. So I think that is one of the most important role of a, of a middle leadership team. So in Malaysia, uh, we have many programs and courses to develop the uh, school middle, middle leadership teams. Uh, and uh, in my own institution, uh, we used to have a lot of CPDs, a lot of programs uh, to develop them. And uh, one of the things that we used to uh, focus is uh, their role as coach and also mentor for the other teachers. That, that's my answer, Dr. Okay. Annalisa. Right. Um, okay. The other question is uh, regarding the role of instructional leader, leaders in the current situation at the new normal, the uh, yeah. current situation of um, COVID-19. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, what would you say about that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. Uh, uh, whoever posted the question. Uh, with the current COVID-19, I think uh, the, the, the principles are a bit, you know, they are a bit uh, it, the, their mindset is a bit challenged as currently at uh, the uh, very concerned about the well-being of the student. And my personal view is uh, at this current status of uh, instructional leadership, I think the first important focus for the, print, for the principal, the instructional leader is to look after the well-being of the students. Uh, when you talk about the well-being of the students, uh, we are talking about students who miss schools. Students of, who have missed instructions. Uh, I think uh, I've assured you this now the scenario or four scenario. Uh, I think one of the biggest role of principals now is to look into the well being. See, many children, I think kids uh, have parents who lost their job uh, and they are unable to continue schooling. And some of them able to come to school, but they might have other issues, a basic necessity, uh, food, uh, resources, and so forth. I think at the current situation, uh, the focus is looking into the well-being of the uh, students. And uh, another biggest challenge of instructional leadership in the COVID-19 is moving into the online learning. Uh, we need to develop the capacity of the teachers and the team, how we could do this online learning, online instruction, how to make it effective, how to encourage more students to participate, to engage. I think that will be should be the focus uh, of principals. Another thing is, there should be, now with the COVID-19, in the air, there is this culture of sharing. Everybody wants to share. Everybody wants to share in YouTube uh, various information. I think principals need to share. They need to have their own community of practice. Uh, they need to share with other principals. What are the big, what are the ideas that other schools are doing in facing different challenges? Rather than we reinvent the wheel every time we have an issue with the COVID, we're able to look at what are the other um, 
practices, best practices done, not only in Malaysia, in other countries, in dealing with this COVID-19, how they, they do effectively deliver the, uh, their instruction. I think these three main areas should be the focus uh, for the uh, school leadership, focusing the well-being, focusing on the online learning, and also the culture of sharing uh, with the other school leaders. So that's my uh, response to the second question, Dr. Annalisa, back to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Valisandra. Um, hmm. Definitely very enlightening on those matters. Uh, well, to sum up the whole, uh, what Dr. Balisandran has uh, presented, he looked at eight focuses, supervision, curriculum, assessment, instructions, technology, the culture and climate, mm -hmm. professional development, and instructional transformation plan. Um, he mm -hmm. has also shared his suggestions, um, looking at uh, two or three goals or agendas in a year, bite-size uh, aims. And then um, what's needed is continuous effort and support to all those involved, the teachers, leaders, um, and uh, then also, of course, there's the perseverance to ensure that everything runs smoothly and um, we, we will achieve our aims. Ministry of Education will achieve their aims. Um, also, the shared leadership and practices, which you uh, spoke of, uh, based on the questions posted to uh, to you, Dr. Balazanran, and as well as the well-being of the students, right? Um, obviously, Dr. Ba has really touched the souls of the educators of the educators with all what he has said just now. Thank you once again, Dr. Balazanran, for enlightening us on the topic. Thank we you. hope and um, we hope that everyone who is watching this virtual colloquium has gained some insights on the matter and at the same time enjoyed the presentation by Dr. Balasandran. With that, this brings us to the end of the session for today. Our next session will be on the 8th of September 2020, and at the same time, uh, at the same sorry, at the same time, 11:30 a.m. Uh, by Professor E. Ramganesh from, ba from Bharati Dasan, University of India. Do join us for this session. Thank you for being with us today. Signing off. <laughs>